Welcome to webinar two of four. In today's uh, webinar, we're going to be talking about exercises for pelvic engagement, because let's face it, that's what we want, right? We hopefully have a better understanding of anatomy, but we really want to know the magic ingredient, which is how to improve the engagement. So for those of you that don't know me, I'm Nika. I am currently in Dubai, hence why this is pre-recorded, but I will be live for the fourth webinar where if you have any questions, feel free to ask me. I, yeah, let's kick on. Okay, so what will we cover today? I'm just going to go briefly into the overview of the first webinar that we did, and then I'm going to be going into why the pelvis, we're going to look at the importance of pelvic engagement, some common issues that I come across in pelvic um engagement from a rider and from a therapist perspective and then I'm going to go into some um, protocols in terms of like what we should be doing when we are designing specific exercises. I'm then also going to support this with some research that's currently out there and I'm going to give you some exercises both from a stable and written perspective that I recommend and have evidence for in my years of treating. If you have any questions at the moment, write them down, send them through to Nikki or email them through to myself if you need answers. Also, feel free to join the fourth webinar where you can ask them live. So this is just a bit of an overview from webinar one where we looked at pelvic function, okay? So what is the function of the pelvic girdle? In my opinion, it is for stability, which can then create the movement, the power that we all seek. We also need to remember that this uh, stability covers many areas. So if you think about the pelvis of a horse, it's there for support, support and protection, movement and mobility, transmissions of forces from front end to the back end, for muscular attachments and for child support especially for obviously for mares but also for stallions right if they have any issues with their pelvic girdle fu function this will affect their ability to perform as a stallion okay we briefly we briefly sorry we went into detail about the pelvic girdle anatomy is specifically focusing on what causes pelvic activation or engagement. And last time I went through these uh, individual form and function of specific muscle groups, uh, in particular, in particular, the iliopsoas and the cranial femoral muscles. And then also, this is for the protraction phase. However, looking at the extension phase, we then went more into depth for the form and function of the caudal femoral muscle. So if you miss that webinar, please go back as it will give you a better understanding before you look at exercises, because I do think that's something that we really need to take responsibility for as a practitioner, as a trainer, as a rider, is if we're trying to improve something, surely we need to know the form and function of it before we can do that for obvious reasons. Okay, just to reiterate, uh, if you have any questions, note them down. You can email them through to me, um, info at animalchiropractoruk.com, or you can email them to Nikki and she can forward them on to me. But we have the live webinar in April to also hopefully um, bring this all together for you quite nicely. So... Why this topic? Why am I interested in this topic? I've come across it quite popular, especially in the sports horse, performance horse field. I do believe it's quite understood. So I just Googled this. So anyone can Google this. I just typed in like, what do people associate with hind limb engagement horses? And this is what came up. So engagement is the bending of hind leg joints, specifically articulation of the pelvis stifles hox fetlocks, enabling the horse to shift his weight off his front end and carry more weight from behind. So that's kind of what we all probably know. This is very lame in terms, but what I really picked up on then, I think this is where a lot of the focus energy and energy is on the joints, right? The hind leg joints. How many of us know stifles, hocks, fetlocks, feet, um, 
that are injected, but actually with a lack of um, recognition and appreciation for the what actually causes and attaches those joints all together. They, in my opinion, are overlooked um, and should be focused on when we're trying to improve and understand uh, hind leg, hind limb, pelvic girdle issues, especially when it comes to engagement in horses. So I thought this was like an important quote because um, most of us, most riders know what hind limb engagement is, but to really understand it and take your eyes away from the stifle hocks fetlocks and look higher up is is not that well understood in my opinion and spoken about as well so the importance of high limb engagement so we know when your horse is engaged they feel more uphill their transitions will be smoother the lateral work will have more fluency and more flow when we break it down there's different components of engagement so for example, the horse should feel forward, freely moving forward, and um, supple through their body, uh, suppleness and willingness to go forward. Straightness is a key factor when we think about hind limb engagement or engagement in general. A straight horse will be able to take more weight behind equally instead of swinging their quarters, maybe to the right, to the left. And how many of us see that out of field, right? We see horses that are not actually straight and yet the rider is looking for hind limb engagement. That Those two um, goals are slightly mishampered if you don't have the straightness. So we also need to think about when we're looking and assessing and in wanting to improve hind limb engagement is the rider, right? What is the rider doing? How is the rider sitting? Because if the horse is moving well, and looking like they are pushing off equally from behind and they have the power from behind, but the minute you put the rider on and the complete image changes, what is the rider doing? Do Does the rider sit straight, but do they have a heavy contact? Because so much of engagement actually comes from the ability of the front end to lift and push off the ground so that the hind leg has somewhere to go. And that's why I've drawn this arrow on the shoulders here because you need the strength the um, precision of the front legs and the power from the shoulder girdle to lift up so that the hind legs can actually go somewhere. Other um, importance of hind limb engagement are, is things like half holds. You know, and this is why some, some traditional trainers and some very um, skilled trainers will really work on the basics of a half fold because the half fold is to understand your horse's ability to slightly change their pace, slightly sit behind and then push. And those are almost the breakdown components that your horse will need before they can engage. Now, before we look into what's not engagement, I just wanna focus on balance because this goes back to the what we've just spoken about with, with um, straightness, with, with suppleness, with, and balance is a key component. So I, I kind of drew this, um, like a seesaw swing um, that we've all been on, on as a kid, right? And um, we all know that um, naturally horses carry more weight onto the front end, yet as a rider or even in hand work, we work solely on the mission. And our main outcome is to have the horse almost reversing the seesaw with more weight onto the hindquarters. Balance in a nutshell is just, is just the distribution of weight that enables your horse to stay upright and steady. So how does this happen? Because if we look at the horse's body, if we, their body is almost like a table, okay, like a table, and they have this long head and neck. The head and the neck are fundamental in helping your horse distribute and work out their balance. Um, and it's, it's a very important lever, basically. And I always think to myself, with the use of training aids to help balance or high-name engagement, if, depending on, obviously, the skill of the hand of it, if the training aid is used, as most of them are nowadays, incorrectly too tight or too low, surely we are encouraging more weight onto the forehand, which it goes against what we're all wanting, which is more, more weight on the hindquarters. So... It is our responsibility if we are 
prescribing things like training aids or riding with their horses as we all quote unquote know the term long and low. Once we understand the function of the pelvic girdle, which hopefully you um, understand better from the last webinar, by having the horse's head too long and low, are we actually creating instability through the key muscles and ligaments that actually cause and produce hind limb engagement? And that's something that I'm constantly toying with myself. Um, most lamenesses actually occur in the front legs or the front limb, the front shoulder girdle. And I think it's because of this natural weight distribution that horses have um, onto their forehand. So I'll go this, I'll go into this in a minute about kind of the key key factors that we need to look into when it comes to lameness in horses. But um, I really want us to just think about when we're assessing horses and we're looking at balance of the horse, imagine the horse and their weight distribution as this almost seesaw effect. And, I, and it also links quite nicely into when we're training and looking at exercises to improve engagement is if they are naturally built, especially certain breeds, heavy on the forehand, the rate of progress that we in, introduce and increase intensity of exercises to, in, to improve engagement should be a little bit slower or could be slower um, given if they're more naturally heavy on the forehand. So visualize this kind of seesaw balance effect um, the whole time when we're assessing and thinking about hind limb engagement in horses. And um, what causes um, unbalanced elements in a horse is the obvious one is lameness. The, the second one is rider, right? Because riders where we naturally sit, especially with the whole topic of ill-fitting saddles, we're naturally putting more weight onto the base um, behind the scapula, so into that area of the shoulder girdle. So that's why if a horse is um, lacking balance, lacking engagement, I always want to start with my exercises, take the rider off straight away. Let's, let's focus on the seesaw effect without the rider, and then we're going to progress to the rider. Another thing we need to think about going back to the front end, front limb or front um, shoulder girdle is the foot balance. And obviously this is front and back, but foot balance is fundamental and limb loading is key when it comes to um, providing uh, or sorry, encouraging hind limb engagement, but also this overall effect of a better balance in our horses. So let's just quickly summarize signs of foot balance. I'm sure we all know what this is, but you've seen these horses, they're almost like motorbike around arenas and corners. And if you've ridden them, or even sometimes lunging on long line, you feel them really heavy in the hand, like over extenuating that front end um, with the weight onto the front end. So the seesaw's completely onto the front end. They feel really uncomfortable in their transitions. Their rhythm is very inconsistent. And a lot of these horses tend to trip. A lot of, the, a lot of them have um, uneven wear, wear on their toes or, the, or medial lateral aspect of their hoof, hoof loading. So this is really, really key. And how do you test your horse's balance? So if from a dressage perspective, um, there's this, and I remember doing it back in the day when competing, which is given and retake the rein. And it's quite early on in um, the dressage tests but it's there because it's showing the judge is your horse in balance are they actually carrying themselves or is the rider very cleverly manipulating which riders can do the balance and it's all actually through their their core and they're carrying the horse so that's quite a good exercise that that um, depending on your clientele you can give is actually some give and retake the rein it, it's a really simple exercise but probably something we should all be doing just to test the balance, test the seesaw. Um, also to focus on like the fundamental scales of training. So we all know these, the rhythm, suppleness, contact, impulsion, straightness, and then the ultimate is collection. So some of the common pelvic engagement issues that I find, obviously first thing we need to do is rule out pain um, and any underlying pathology before we can recommend any exercises. Um, 
consider, which I spoke about a little bit last time, which is the, the, the automatic reciprocal and stay apparatus systems in horses. I think it's sometimes, again, a little bit over underlooked. Um, would be good to, I could probably do some, do a webinar on that. Um, if you guys want that, let Nikki know. But um, when it comes to kind of common engagement issues, I have noticed like a, a pattern of four common areas and they are the lumbar sacral joint, the coxofemoral joint, the front limb lameness and head and neck positioning. Um, I'm just going to quickly describe each of them. So head and neck position is directly affecting the vertebral column, as we, as I previously mentioned. It's, it's like a lever, it's like a lever, but it, depending on the head and neck position, it can have a direct repercussion on the lumbar sacral and the coxofemoral joint. We know the importance of the lumbar sacral joint and its and its attachments. We spoke about this in the last webinar, and it has an active role in hind limb engagement. So if there is a pathology of pain there, the engagement will or hind limb engagement will automatically be affected. So we need to rule any pain there. Um, we also need to be thinking about the front leg, front end, and in particular, as I mentioned, hoof balance is so critical. Another um, variable that is often not really discussed is terrain, right? Because I have some clients that will, their horse moves really well at home, training really well at home, and then they go to a competition and they, they'll say to me, oh, I'm really disappointed with performance. Like there's just no push, there's lack of power behind. And and um, looking at the arena, like it's a completely different arena. Like most good level arenas have a consistent give to them. But if, if there is a dramatic change and you haven't conditioned your horse or the rider hasn't conditioned the horse, to loading, limb loading and carrying the weight and having to exercise in a different terrain, how can you expect the horse to perform the same and have the, the engagement from behind? It's it's not fair. Um, so that's quite a, like a little factor to consider. Okay, so when it comes to exercises to improve pelvic engagement, like where do we start with this? I'm gonna start, just my opinion, like what does the research say? Because um, the more, there's more and more research coming out, especially when it comes to these exercises. So this is great news. However, um, in comparison to like human um, research and even some canine, I feel like those there's more of it compared to the equine field. So, but it, but it's coming. First study here that I like to just quickly talk about is from Hillary and team. I mean, everyone knows Hillary Clayton, and this was a study done to assess the impact of uh, gymnastic training and dynamic mobilization exercises on improving stride length and, and enhancing the size of the patio muscles in therapy horses. So they just term them like gym and DME exercises. Um, and what they looked at specifically was stride length and like tracking up, tracking over, and then also the multifidus muscle cross-sectional area. Um, the exercises that they did from a gym perspective, which they called the gymnastics, was a pelvic tilt, backing up, turning in circles and walking over race poles. And like these, again, because we have research, are definitely some of the exercises I would use in personalized programs. Um, pelvic tilting, because it's aimed at strengthening abdominals and pelvic stabilizing. Backing up because encourage um, engagement of the core muscles. And it's such a good exercise, I think, in like a full body collection preparation exercise is the rain back. I, I love what it does on a postural muscle perspective. Turning in small circles, focusing uh, focuses on improving flexibility and muscle engagement. And I actually found um a, a research paper on like uh, these lateral movements and circle movements um, as well. So I, I have reference it later on. And then obviously everyone mostly knows about walking over poles. However, it's good just to have some, some proof now that or why we should be walking our horses over poles. And going to the examples they did with the dynamic mobilization exercises, these are things like chin to chest, um, chin to carpite uh, and chin to fetlocks, which um, is aimed at activating and strengthening the deep spinal stabilizing muscle muscles, uh, multifidus. 
and um, also like neck extension exercises to engage and strengthen the neck and upper back muscles and um, there was there's they did show that doing these over a period of time with a specific frequency per week does have positive effects um, on stride length but also more on the cross-sectional area of the paxial muscle however like most of these studies the sample size is just under 10 or sorry is, is quite limited and also it's very specific to they did therapy horses and and not everyone just as therapy horses most of us are doing like an array of different competition horses from low level to high level comp competing so the good thing is research research is coming out however there is much more needed and I actually found another study which I've not noted down but um I've got it written down here which was by Lucas a uh, recent one by 2022 and they did a seven week period of dynamic mobilization exercises and neuromuscular electrical stimulation to increase the cross-sectional area of the multifidus in horses and they found this improved spinal stabilization so th the interesting thing about this study they divided the group into two two horse two groups of horses one only did the um that dynamic exercises the uh, basically the neck lateral neck baited stretches and the other group had um, this electrical stimulation on specific areas of the spine uh, uh, and actually uh, after the seven weeks they both had a significant effect on the cross-sectional area of the multifidus muscle so it kind of makes you think oh do we just do therapy do owners just need to have this electrical stimulation machine and do it themselves um or it's actually given us some more research that especially horses with coming back from kissing spine surgery and need really focused rehab on the multifidus could um, an owner would, would we recommend teaching and helping an owner with this machine plus utilizing and being consistent with the um, dynamic mobilization exercises to really improve that specific muscle. And I think that's where science is going now, which I actually find it really exciting um, to give some evidence. Another study here, which looked at the effect of effectiveness of stretching for horses, it was by Frick um, in the early, so I think this one, I need to get the exact date. Um, I think it was like 2018. So not very recent, but not exactly ancient. And they looked at highlighting the potential of doing these stretches to increase the range of motion, improve body um flexibility and posture and prevent by prevent injury by stretching supporting tissue soft, soft tissue um tissues um again this this study was supporting the use the only thing was it was a very very small sample size and it does again make me question whether we can really recommend um sorry, use studies like this for, for all horses with stretching because it was is a very small sample size. But like I said, since this one, actually, we have had many others like the Hillary Clayton one and also the Lucas one, which shows that, um, and these are, again, not high level competition horses, but they are um, competition horses at low levels that it does have a pos pos positive effect and significant effect on the cross-sectional area of the multifidus muscle and it's just good to have some um data right and um, especially when it comes to looking and talking to our farriers and our vets just to have some proof about what we're doing because luckily nowadays if vets don't know what after work um exercises specifically are or activation exercises um it's our job to educate them it's our job to have um the research ourselves the knowledge but then to, to provide it to um, vets and um, this is a study that I found with the equi band so resistant bands and it was the effect of a four week elastic resistant band training regime on the back kinematics in horses trotting in hand and on the lunge the study um, was only on seven horses they were all privately owned mid like the the age range was from four to again 22 which adds a lot of variables to it um, and 
what they did is they looked at the transitional, so the dorsal, ventral, mediolateral, and rotational, so basically like the roll and pitch um, range of motion on six landmarks from the pole all the way to the, to the sacrum region. And they assessed them trotting on a hard surface and on the lunge with and without the elastic bands. They found that the bands reduced roll and pitch with medial lateral displacement in the thoracolumbar region. And at week four, the independent band usage um, had a rotational movement. Sorry, the rotational movement was reduced. Um, and basic, so basically, in summary, that within only four weeks, they found that utilizing the resistant band improved stability through the through the thoracolumbar region and isn't that what we want as riders right or trainers or therapists we want more stability in the region so the horse can carry rider weight so overall again positive study again we have to uh talk about limitations though and this is it when people are like oh should i get an equiband for my horse it's a no-brainer right and i'm thinking the research the limited research we have is showing um, that it has positive effects. However, can we recommend this for every horse? No. The data out there is too um, variable and the sample size is too small. And also, it really doesn't overtake the importance of regular assessment and um, skill level of our, our handlers and our owners because the issue with a lot of these bands is that they the instructions are so so um small that, that they don't go into detail and that's the thing so anyone can any lay person can buy these bands however like i said this was only a four week um program and i found a lot of owners will buy the bands and stick them on straight away with no like habituation period with no gradual build-up and this is the key that where we need more research too before i recommend it to everyone um so this was a cool study that looked at res resistance bands and ground poles in walk and trot they looked at the effect of ground poles and elastic resistance bands on the longissimus dorsi and rectus abdominis muscles during walk and trot so with and without the bands and this band resistance was 25 percent, whereas the other study was 30 percent resistance of the band and that's another very subjective subjective factor right is um there's no ballpark resistance that we should be having with all the horses and that's why i don't recommend bands all the time i only would do them if i know the horse really well i know the owner more than anything and oh, i almost do the session with them progressively so first of all let's just go through a little bit of an overview so long pissimus dorsi good for stability or function and stability and rectus abdominis rectus abdominis for flexing the thoracolumbar spine so flex so you know two different kind of uh, main functions of these muscles but really important when it comes to engagement and um, stability through the spine they this was a study done by Shaw uh, and his team, 2021. So again, nice recent study. And they looked at six horses, again, varying ages. So a little bit of variability there. The horses were trotted in hand and evaluated, obviously, flameness uh, or any kind of neurological deficits. Nothing was there. The study used eight ground poles, which is nice to have a number as well, because how many people are like, oh, do pull up with your horse? And the owners are like, go to these clinics where they set up a million poles when... We don't have research for how often and how many, what effect those number of poles has on the horse's body. So um, yeah, eight poles were used um, for walk and trot distance with, uh, with the equiband at 25%. They used the surface um, electromyography um, for, for measuring the longissimus dorsi and the rectus abdominis. They found that there was a significant increase um, of the um, usage of the longissimus and the rectus. Um, how, however, when they went to trot, there was actually more more significant, um, oh gosh, there was more significant um, 
value and um, effect on the rectus abdominis compared to the um, longissimus dorsi muscle. Um, what I would just say about this study is obviously the, the sample size was quite small, but they didn't really go into the control group comparison to provide clear understandings of these effects on intervention. So again, a few limitations and flaws to the study, but it's still a study and it's still a great starting point and does show that the use of ground poles, walk and trot with the resistance band at 25% does have an effect on the longissimus and rectus abdominis. So kind of the next stage from this would be um, obviously having the control group, but then also having a understanding of duration and frequency, because this is again, a common question is how often should we be doing ground or pole work, walk trot um, on these resistance bands for um, routine training? And, and this is where there is limited research th throughout the equestrian industry. This study was done in 2002 and it looked at the effects of the equi ami training aid, which everyone must know by now, on the kinematics of the horse in walk and trot. Um, they looked at eight horses and they utilized the training aid four days per week. Um, the horses were really habituated to the equi ami as well, which is obviously always a good thing. Um, and with the study, there was actually no significant effect on the mean, so the collective and overall walk and trot on the horse, um, on the horses. However, they did show that there was like slight differences within each horse individually. So they're not saying that it, it was no effect using the equiami, they just say it wasn't significant on the walk and trot. And this again makes me, um, question when we generally prescribe things like equiami to our um, owners that we should really be thinking about the confirmation the posture the training level the skill obviously of the the owner but then also what's our goal and um, because there's it's shockingly not enough evidence to give a generic answer about yes equiami a horse for 20 minutes in walk and you will have this effect on the back or trot your horse for this amount of time over this amount of poles with the equiami on and it will have this guaranteed effect like that and this is I suppose where I'm very reluctant to hand out aids training aids just because there's no research yet but I'm pretty sure it's getting better and better um, I haven't put the other research in here, but there's so much more support with the use of just walking poles with horses. Um, I know Russell Guire has done a lot of research on that and he keeps doing more and more, which is fantastic. So we should very soon in the next few years have actually some numbers that we can refer back to on when it comes to specific protocols and giving owners, um, you know, exact um, plans of pole work, how many times in walk, for how long, with or without the aid, with or without the resistance band. It's coming, but at the moment, for me, it's not there yet. So just want to talk about when it comes to rehabilitation of any area of the horse, but let's particularly focus on the engagement. We need to be thinking about, right, what is our aim? Because surely it is to return the horse to its previous level of performance, or if not, if it's at a good level of performance, we want to enhance that level of performance. This should be done progressively, depending on the severity of the injury, but or the weakness to improve proprioception, neuromuscular control, and to load and strengthen the, the musculoskeletal tissues, which should be done very, very gradually. We all know, and we hope they do take full history with accurate assessments. We have a collaborative team approach where we can bounce ideas off and have some more understanding and clarification about why we are prescribing these exercises. And it's also good to have 
and that level of understanding of, you know, things like con uh, concentric exercises versus eccentric exercises and whether we want dynamic flexibility, static, like these factors really should be thought about carefully when we are prescribing um, a exercise protocol. The other thing that we need to think about is almost like reverse engineering the goal. So once we know what we want to do, the long-term goal, what's the short-term goal? Because short-term goals for me would be like stable-based isometric exercises, which, which would be to establish like the baseline tolerance of the first assessment. So what, where are they currently at? And then where we want to get to. Um, and it could even be things like from going from load bearing on three legs to load load bearing equally on all four legs so it, it needs to be uh, measurable and um, specific exercise progressions need to be as they say progressive right i like to and it is actually a little bit of support in human rehabilitation about actually changing one variable at a time so whether it's the intensity the frequency or the gradient but to pick one and you do that progressively um over one or two weeks, depending on how the horse is already progressing, depending on how consistent the owner's been, because horses actually want to and will recover quite quickly. It's just usually a management issue. It's usually an issue of owners, unfortunately, not being consistent or a lack of knowledge and, and understanding. So just before I go into the specific exercises, I need to just say like, these exercises are a collection of my own research, case studies and CPD hours. Please do your own research on it um, and work with your vet to ensure you're performing the exercises correctly for your client and your horse. Because like I said, the research that I've shown you, there isn't specific step-by-step um, -step guidelines. It's coming. I think there's a lot more in dogs now and, and like I said, in humans. But it still needs that individuality. It still needs that teamwork from your vet. So please don't copy and paste. Um, be... Um, have your clinical reasoning and be curious and ask questions because what might work for one horse might will not work for another horse. Um, so my stable-based exercises, I'd, I'd recommend, I'm going to start with some three um, isometric-based exercises. I You can do a tail traction. We all know the tail is an extension of the spine. Often, like again, forgotten about when it comes to not only treatment but when it comes to rehabbing especially horses that are quite painful throughout their body and they're still um there's a lot of changes happening we can do a lot of work with the tail and um, the tail for me develops stability through the small postural muscles of the spine and um, by causing activation okay so a couple of ways that you can do this you can either do like a, the the lateral tail or the um, straight tail and I like to obviously stand behind the horse be careful for obvious reasons and um, before again a lot of people I see just want to pull the tail straight away step one is actually just to have the horse stood comfortably behind where they lift up the tail and you can feel it under the hand but it's a light pressure and um, there is actually a little bit more research on this to show about the pressure because a lot you see these things on like um youtube and that with people like hanging off the tails and like pulling them and losing all their body weight and uh, i don't know if that works or not but i think less is always more and having that sensitivity and feel to have the tail sit nicely in your hand with with, with very little pressure is key and you can build it up from there so even doing that deep just holding the tail there the horse can feel the sensitivity and that can be enough to start to start firing the nerve endings and and stimulating some stability through the spine um and that can just be like a 30 second hold we know that there's so many um uh, that's going to have a direct effect on the fascia lines as well so really really simple exercise but again so super effective and um most owners know their horses trust their horses obviously if you see that it's not working and there's a level or any any indication that the horse can kick please don't give this exercise um but yeah tail traction exercises for me are really really 
um, important when it comes to engagement um, and, and promoting some stability um, through the spine. Another one which we all know about, I'm sure, is the caudal pelvic tilt. And um, uh, this can be varied. So if you're getting bored with it or if you're thinking, like, how do I vary this? You've, you can do different intensity or and duration, right? Because um, the reason the caudal pelvic tilt is so effective is because it's, it's doing what we want the horse to do in engagement, which is to lift, flex the thoracolumbar spine and bring the hindquarters underneath them. A caveat to that though, and this is why I've mentioned the other exercise, which most of you know anyway, is the abdominal lift, because should we be first encouraging core engagement, so lifting, contracting of the abdominals, but then lifting that, which has a direct effect on the thoracic sling, engaging up, flexing through the thoracic lumbar spine, and then recommending the caudal pelvic tilt so the hindquarters have somewhere to go it's 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 that similar kind of like what comes first the chicken or the egg or do you need the hind limb engagement first and then apply the abdominal lift you decide um it's definitely something i often think about when giving this exercise however it also depends on the management right because if some horses don't like doing the abdominal lift or they can't do it and this is actually more common than I see, I don't know if you guys agree, but I see a lot of horses that actually can't do an abdominal lift at all. They just stand there looking at you. Um, there's obviously other ways you can do it, but that um, simple exercise, some horses can't do. So um, in that case, the quarter pelvic tilt, um, depending on the length of the spine as well, and the postural muscles already there, can be really, really effective at also um, um, targeting the abdominals because of the, the, the muscular connection and insertion points. Um, once we've done a good level of isometric stable-based exercises, then moving on to dynamic-based exercises. And dynamic-based exercises for me are non, non-ridden. <laughs> um, we all, like, how many of you know when you go out there and the horse has had surgery or they've had that intervention and it's like box rest ride? What what about the in-between bit? What about the bit where the horse has to get used to moving following box rest and then progress to a saddle and then progress to a rider? Like there should be a specific process for that. Um, yeah, so some of the exercises I love doing from a dynamic perspective are transitions, circles, and lateral work. And we actually have more and more research coming out for, for, for even circles now, like lateral movement in horses, which is really, really exciting. Um, looking at um, transitions though, we, we I don't know about you, but I remember when I used to do my training and competing, it was all about transitions, 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 transitions. You can vary the intensity of a transition. You can vary the quality. And obviously if you start from halt walk, then walk, trot, 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 walk, trot, canter. Like the, the transitions should be part of every single dynamic-based program because there's so many levels to it. Um, I get my, my clients to focus on the quality of their transitions, to think carefully about what they're seeing and what they're applying, whether it's on the long lines from the nose or from a ridden perspective. If, for example, they are riding them and they feel the quarter swinging before the transition, don't do the transition. We then have to maybe come back to a walk until the quarters are straight in the walk, then progress to the trot. Um, circles for me. So circles, you can vary in size. You can obviously vary the pace, the frequency. It's the so good as part of um, exercises for, again, hind limb engagement because of what effect they have through the spine Um and also through the abdominals. A really cool study by, uh, I think it's called Bystrom et al, 2002, looked at lateral work um, in and collected movements in dressage horses. And they looked at the vertical excursion of the withers and the croup. Fascinating, it was only a pilot study, but for those of you, I'd really recommend looking into it. It was a really interesting study to read. Um, they, focused on 10 horses and um, the riders would do a free walk and they would measure the excursion. So how much movement was happening in the withers 
and the sacrum and then increased it from a free walk into collected movements and it was quite fascinating if my brain remembers i think the the vertical excursion of the withers like increased with collection whether the sacrum decreased um and the, it was almost a role reversal for, for non-collected movement. So it that then makes me think about right. If I'm giving if the if the horse has had an injury to the shoulder girdle, um, and how much lateral work versus um circle work should we be giving them? Or if it was um the other way around, so if it was a sacrum injury or a hind limb um or a, sorry a pelvic girdle injury how much lateral work should we be giving? So it was only a pilot study, but it's a really good foundation to start making your brain think about like a circle, progressing the circle and eventually to some lateral work. Obvious, obviously though, we know that lateral work comes in different stages, for example, like shoulder in, um, leg yield, traver, ronver. And we all know that a lot of these lateral movements encourage the limbs to move across the body, away from the body, underneath the body. And, they are so important, I believe, as part of even early stage rehab, depending on the pathology, because it prepares the horse for ridden work. It pre pre prepares the horse for the demands and restraints um, initiated by when riders especially start to get on board. Because most riders are impatient, right? Most riders find straight line work boring. So if we can do a lot of the um, straight line work and the lateral work without the rider on then the horse is conditioned and the proprioception the neuro um sensory system is conditioned to those movements before we then put the weight of the rider and the horse uh saddle sorry and that's why for me that is a really important factor when we look at um incorporating exercises into treatment plans we need to i really want you guys to think about and i'm sure you do this already but it's just to reiterate it um Owner ability is so important. If you don't see the owner do it, don't prescribe it. Um, your own skill set, being honest with yourself, because a lot of us, it's a lot to know out there and it's a lot to keep on top of. Be honest with yourself. If you don't know, join forces with people, ask questions, work as a team. It's just one of my like real uh, kind of self-reflection journeys that I'm on where I'm like, we can't know everything. And, and and this is just me, like, don't be protective of your clients. Be open-minded because in the day we want the best for the horse, right? So if you don't know the answer, seek help, ask questions. Um, I don't know all the answers, but I seek help and, I, and, and I'll seek advice from someone else who will know or might know when we come together and we discuss it. Don't guess, okay? Um, with treatment plans, though, the key is, and especially when I'm working with my owners, is I... I anticipate room for error because you think you're going well and you think that everything's um the horse is moving in a direction in the right direction with the exercises you're giving and suddenly there'll be like a, a massive turn of events and it'll all just fall to pieces <laughs> this is rehab this is this is training of horses so allow that room for error and almost prepare your owners for it as well if you are prescribing these plans because um it, it helps with their expectation because uh, I think there's that cool curve, which is like rehab does not go like that. And progression and training exercises don't always go like this. And um, it's like a circular backward effect and the spiral downward and then upward and, and, and eventually get there. But that setting those expectations of room for error with your treatment plans is really important. And just a little summary. Here, I think I did it last time where um, we have the hind limb engagement issue, or the pelvic engagement issue. What do we do? We go for a full team history approach, we go two ways. It can either be an undiagnosed pain, undiagnosed uh, pathology. In that case, we need a team approach. You need to create a specific plan, which usually for me starts in the stable, progression to in-hand, progression to ridden. But it's like a continuous loop. It's a continuous cycle of team, recreate the plan, monitor, progress, and so forth. However, if you go back to the full history team approach and you've identified that there's absolutely no pain and it's just a weakness, no pain is key, just a, a, a weakness. I'd say just a weakness, it's still a big deal. But then that's when you have the progressive plan as well that again is a team approach. Um, the team approach also includes your owner. Just please remember that because they are, they are the ones that are gonna 
actually create the change. Yes, you provide the tools, but they are the one that are going to have the results with their um, consistency and their honesty to do the work. It's not easy. <laughs> okay, any questions? I know was a long one today. Um, any questions, send them through to my email address above or message Nikki. And I will look forward to seeing you in the next, on the next <laughs> webinar. Bye for now.